Okay, I think we've got Lori and Katie on board, so uh, they're going to be co-hosting and watching the chat box. So if you have questions as we move through this evening, make sure that you pop those in there and we'll do like we've been doing for the last several weeks and uh, get those answered and sent out to you in a Word doc tomorrow. Um, so if this is your first night joining us, uh, we welcome you to uh, our Monday Musings. This is class number 18, I think. So we've been going pretty strong uh, through all this COVID mess since uh, March 30th, I think. I think Jim Kennedy said it best there a minute ago. It's uh, nice to talk about something besides the virus right now. So um, tonight we're really going to dig our heels in and talk a lot about soil because those of you that know me, I've been trying to prepare you for the last couple weeks. Um, this is this is where it's all um, where it's all at. So um, let me think a few housekeeping items. I think most of you are probably in our Google Drive. Have access to that where we put uh, tonight's video recording along with um, some extra documentation and supplemental material. If you're not a member of that, don't worry, you'll get a link with that as well, either tonight or tomorrow when I when I email you all this good stuff from tonight. Uh, so with that, like I say, as we move through, just ask questions in the chat box, and because uh, I can't really see everybody except for Leanne, so <laughs> um, we'll just jump right in here and get started. So again, welcome tonight, and um, I think we've got a huge range of states, too. I think I wrote down about seven different states that are represented tonight, so again, welcome. All right, so I really like teaching this class. Uh, this time of year because if we teach it in the springtime, sometimes I feel like we're trying to keep up and we might be running just a tad tad behind. So um, in the fall, that's the best time to start preparing our soil for the next year for our gardens. Um, I chose this picture to kind of kick us off and it's it's been one of those that um, when I do this presentation, it's kind of stayed at the front of this uh, presentation. Sometimes I'll uh, switch it out with drought conditions and but you know we've not had a lot of that we've been under an enormous amount of water here in the last couple of years but um, obviously from this we can tell that drainage is going to be an issue for this field but sometimes we don't maybe always recognize that drainage can be an issue even if it's on flat ground for instance so I don't know if you can see this right here but these tomato plants are kind of struggling a little bit and you can tell from the growth here it's probably on a, in the middle of summer but a big issue here is it's just um, poor drainage due to site selection sometimes we know that sometimes we don't as gardeners sometimes we, we don't really have an option with with what we have you know the locations available to us but uh, this can also be promoted by shallow watering which we've got drip tape here you can see that so that's probably not going to be the issue but anytime that we're shallow watering that's going to promote those roots to go out at the soil line rather than going deep so that's another practice we want to get a get away from but you can see here again drainage can be an issue even in areas we don't necessarily think so again, just uh, trying to set the scene for tonight because we're going to try to start easy and work our way in to some of the harder aspects um, of soil as we as we move through tonight. So just remember that it all begins again with dirt. We're going to take that good old dirt, which is on the bottom of our shoes, and we're going to turn that into a growing medium or soil. So if we do that right and we continually keep at it, then we're going to continually see our uh, results grow. So just a disclaimer, uh, just to let you know that we are going to be talking about soil. I'm not going to talk a lot about growing medium tonight. Uh, just a big difference here is that soil is actually a living organism. It's going to be made up of different minerals that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. And it is biologically and chemi chemically active, whereas that growing media um, is just going to kind of mimic soil, um, although it does have its advantages as far as being lighter, maybe easier to manage nutrients and fewer pathogens that can exist and reside there year after year. So tonight I sent uh, y'all an agenda Friday if you had registered before Friday. So um, if you have that, you can tell this is a condensed version of that. But basically, again, we're gonna just start with soil and move right up to soil sampling and, and what we need to be doing now to amend our soil. 
So you've heard me harp on this for several weeks, for several months about soils. That's where the basis of everything begins. But, but why does that matter? You know, why, why is it so critical? Well, it's going to be essential for food production, obviously. Um, any of our small scale uh, truck farming all the way up to our commercial row crops are going to depend on a healthy and viable soil for productivity. It's kind of cool that we can actually manipulate uh, some components of the soil, specifically pH, uh, to get different colors in our landscape, like you can see here with this hydrangea. Uh, for those that, of you that know me, know I'm a, a certified wine judge, so I really enjoy tasting different wines from all over the world, and that's greatly impacted by the terroir or by the soil, those mineral deposits um, from, from the earth. So that can actually affect grape and the wine quality. And then here's a picture, luckily we don't have to deal with this um, here in the United States. Uh, this is, you know, actually, um, this actually goes on in some other parts of the world where they're trying to garden on the steep side of these terrace slopes. And you can tell from this picture that We've got a lot of soil loss and degradation over time. Um, you can tell by the, the color of that soil, the quality might be a little bit off. So we're very fortunate here that we've got the opportunity to continually grow our soil and make it work for us. And then of course, erosion is another big factor. This is taken from uh, space. I'm not exactly sure where this is at, but it gives us a good visual as to just uh, how much runoff can occur. If we're not protecting um, one of our vital elements here. And that kind of bridges or uh, segues us into uh, soil stewardship because what we do with our soil does greatly impact our lawns, landscapes, and our, our gardens, orchards, vineyards, whatever that might be. So when it comes to our vegetable garden, of course, uh, a lot of those practices we're going to talk about tonight or next week, but those cover crops and compost, uh, tillage, mulches, and then a, a, a balanced nutrition plan, a good fertility plan. Same thing in our landscape bed. You know, we're going to have specific practices that are going to be critical to help us prevent some of those um, erosion factors like irrigation and not over fertilization. As far as orchards, um, there's going to be some issues there with tillage that we might not necessarily think about on our smaller scale gardens or landscaping. And then if we like to get out and enjoy fishing, whether that be in a pond or lake or a creek on our property, uh, we have to think about uh, fertilizer leaching. We have to think about erosion. All those factors are going to greatly influence soil over time. Whether it's sedimentation, where it's just depositing huge amounts of sediment over time. Um, I'm from Western North Carolina, so a little town, Waynesville, North Carolina, and we have the... Uh, the Methodist Assembly there at Lake Junaluska, and it's this, you know, great big, huge, well, it's not a huge lake, but pretty nice um, size body of water, but uh, it's probably just a couple of feet deep, even in the middle of it, just because of the sedimentation. Everything pretty well gathers in that lake before heading on down the Pigeon River, but uh, uh, eutrophication and hypoxia can both occur. That's going to be lack of oxygen or with eutrophication, that's just a huge amount of um, growth, the algae and some of that scum that we see. Um, as far as some take home points, just in that regard, we just want to make sure that we become very intimate with our site, whatever that site is, if it's for a vegetable garden, um, on our homestead, whatever we're growing, um, popcorn or blueberries or nettles, I think Russ is on here, grows nettles, whatever we're growing, uh, we need to just know what that soil is, what our crop needs, and we, we want to be able to improve that soil over time. Because the big clincher is knowing that we can go fix our soil this fall, or maybe this is something that we've been doing and, you know, we took the soil test maybe a couple years ago, or we're just getting started maybe in 2021, but if you fix it this year, that doesn't mean you're done. It's something that we have to continually work on over time. So how does soil fill the role that plants need? And there's gonna be lots of different ways, of course. Providing a physical support is gonna be um, a really important one. 
uh, but points two and three there, holding water for plant uptake and holding nutrients. And we're gonna get to that to the end, toward the end of the program. Uh, we need to be able to maintain air near the roots for respiration. And then it's also a mechanism for releasing uh, plant nutrients in that soil solution. And it's gonna help cycle those nutrients and be a benefit. So again, just harping more on soil. We study it because again, that's what we're gonna be growing our crops in. Um, it is gonna be that medium for plant growth. It's gonna be home to all kinds of organisms that are actually very beneficial and are gonna help us to build that soil. Um, it's gonna be a waste decomposer. It's gonna help filter water and waste out of the soil. So it's an excellent filter. And it's just one of our, well, probably our most essential natural resource. And there are gonna be three components to soil science, which is physical, biological, and chemical. And we're gonna to touch on each of these in just brief detail. Hopefully just so you'll gain a better understanding to be able to put the puzzle pieces together and see why it's so critical. Just a few mentions there on description. You'll notice here that organic matter is about 5%. Of course, that's gonna vary, but that's one reason we need to continually strive to build that organic matter layer in our soil because as you're gonna see from tonight, if we have just a dead soil, it's, it's not gonna really produce a lot. So I don't wanna give away what I'm talking about, but in essence, I put this slide in here, just so you can kind of tuck it in the back of your mind. So hopefully as we move through tonight, you'll know just how critical this organic matter content is gonna be. So just one way to illustrate that would be for um, blueberries. If you're planting blueberry bushes, I always, We'll say make sure that we've got a higher organic matter content because blueberries like, like those little blueberry um, root hairs and um, it can be detrimental if we allow uh, fertilizer or anything like that to touch those bare roots. But also that organic matter is what I call the fluff in the soil. So blueberries don't like to be sitting in water. So if we have a higher organic matter content, that's gonna help with drainage because those blueberries don't like wet feet. So again, just kind of teasing you here with some of this, uh, trying to kind of set the stage. Uh, we do have horizons in our soil profile, and I'm gonna try to keep it simple tonight. You can see here uh, the A horizon and the B horizon and then C. So that A horizon is gonna be that top soil or surface soil, and then we're gonna talk about subsoil and then what we call the bedrock or the parent material. And a lot of different things are gonna affect what our soil is, and that's a process because it is a living organism that occurs over time. And you can see those listed here from weathering to what we're doing is with human impact. So just think about a new construction site, what that can do to the soil, short term and long term. So again, just to try to tuck this in the back of your mind as we move through tonight. Can't see my entire schematic because I have that picture right here, but you can see the the A horizon here is gonna be about six to eight inches. You can see the turf right there and how, how we go down. Um, but this, this is where we're gonna see most of the roots, the root growth occur. And then we have the B horizon. Um, we also want that to be about 30 inches. So together combined, we want about 36 inches there. This layer up here, you can see it's a little bit darker. That's because we do have a little bit of organic matter. Um, added in or amended to that A horizon. But just keep in mind, we do want about 36 inches. Some of us, that's gonna be nearly impossible. If you're in Green County, we've got some soils in the north end of the county that are gonna be shale. Um, um, we're also gonna have some limestone deposits. So it, it's just, we run the whole gamut here in the county. Uh, as far as landscape position, this is something we could spend an entire evening on, but I'm, I'm not gonna do that to you, but I do want you to kind of have these slides in there for reference, and there's some notes and some um, website links that will help guide you on this, but just knowing on our property what these different, uh, this, these different terminologies mean. Upland, uh, side slope, the foot slope, uh, terrace, and, the, and a floodplain. And obviously, this is not where we want to be. Um, is in that flood, flood plain. 
but just knowing what each of these brings and like I say in the Google Drive they'll these will be bulleted out so you can see that a little bit better but here's some pictures hopefully that will show that just a tad bit because I know if I get started on this I'll eat up like 30 minutes so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep quiet and move on but just know that you have that in there for reference and, re and refer back to that because it can um, it can affect where you want to put a garden site or an orchard or anything like that. Um, also know that vegetation can send us clues. Uh, I don't remember which class we were talking, maybe it was in our weeds class, and I showed you several weeds and told you what those could be indicators of. So again, you've got that for reference in the Google Drive, but make sure you pay attention um, to that vegetation. You'll see here that we've got this uh, tall, dense stand of grass, and usually when we see that, then we know that's gonna be a deep, well-drained soil. And you can see this, is pretty much an ev or accurate hypothesis because these vegetables grow in the background. Whereas if we look at this picture up in the right hand corner, this is probably a weed several of us are seeing right now. This is Dallas grass. Um, and it kind of prefers a droughtier soil. So if we see that, typically we know that that could be a problem site because it's going to grow in those conditions that um, it's just going to take hold and grow anywhere. It's a low fertility soil. So soil is made again by different factors. Those are going to be climate, living organisms, that parent material, which can be, we were talking about shell and limestone a minute ago, sandstone, uh, the topography, and then time. You know, and just, just like us, we change with time, soil changes with time as well. Just remember that there's a whole world under our feet, and that is where the foundation begins. So it's maybe often hard or hard for us to realize that because we can't actually see that with with the naked eye but again just putting that money and effort into improving that soil before we we plant is going to behoove us in the long run because if if, if your soil is not right your plants are going to let you know real quick and often that can be costly uh, just a couple of pictures here uh, millipedes centipedes uh, this little tiny one here is a springtail um, even grub worms, we talked about those a couple weeks ago in insect class, and they can be very detrimental uh, to some of our gardens and landscape, but they also provide channels through, through the soil, so that's going to provide aeration. And spiders are also a, a benefit. So if we see those things uh, maneuvering around in our garden sites, and that's usually a pretty good indi indication there. Uh, as far as that organic matter, when we have those creatures uh, that we've invited to um, be in our garden, uh, usually that's through the addition of organic matter of some, some type. And we're gonna talk more about that here in just a few minutes. But when we talk about organic matter, and remember that little pie chart I showed you, that little teeny slice of the pie, you know, that's what we have the least amount of um, in our soil profile. But when we start adding this organic matter, um, it's gonna help us improve our water holding capacity which in turn is gonna help improve that nutrient holding capacity. It's gonna increase the availability of both to our plants. It's uh, continually building that soil structure. It's gonna help us reduce compaction. It's gonna reduce cresting. It's gonna improve infiltration. And infiltration is when it's raining or making it rain and how that goes into our garden in essence. You know, we don't want it run it off. We want it filtering down deep into the root system. And then of course, it's gonna increase that soil biological activity and biodiversity, and then again, nutrient cycling. So you're gonna hear me repeat some of this stuff tonight because I really want you to kind of come full circle and, and really put these pieces together because again, tonight's class is all about um, bridging the gap between what we've talked about and what, where we're moving in the next several weeks. So when we do talk about soil, of course, we have, um, airspace that we don't necessarily always think about. But again, some of those microbes are gonna help us. Um, earthworms, I think I have a picture in here in a few minutes. Um, we also have all of these bacteria and fungal hyphae, you see that right here. Sometimes we don't think about those things necessarily being in soil, but they are there and they're often necessary for us to continually build that soil. Uh, we do have some that are bad, but, but not all are bad. So let's talk about a few of these. So bacteria, is really cool because a, a teaspoon of soil is going to contain a monumental amount 
can't even count all those zeros. It makes me cross-eyed. Uh, but that's a, a huge amount of bacteria. And all these bacteria are going to serve different functions. And of course, the decomposers, that first one is what we talk about all the time. Uh, mutualist, something that's just serving as a synergistic, um, you know, both organisms are benefiting in essence. Of course, we have pathogens there. And then chemotrophs, which we usually don't deal too much with those, think about those deep in the ocean. They're basically using like underwater volcanoes as a heat source. Um, but so uh, you can also see here this red clover, I don't know if you can see these nodules on the root. And we always talk about nitrogen fixing bacteria. So these leg leguminous crops will actually do that. They enhance our soil because they're grabbing nitrogen from the air and they're turning in that into a usable nitrogen for our plants in the ground. Um, this is going to be the most plentiful in the rhizosphere. So when we talk about rhizosphere, rhizo, that means root. Uh, so that's where we want that to be occurring. And then we have fungi. They really are the fungi sometimes. They're going to be the largest in total biomass. We're going to see those more often in our woodland environments. Think of our, our, our forest. Um, you know, hiking through the, the Smokies is where you're going to see a lot of those fungal species. But they too can be decomposers, but they can also be parasitic which is what we're seeing here. I'll notice the Latin here, but this is actually Southern blight. You can see that sclerotia and what that looks like in the soil. So when we talk about soil-borne pathogens, remember those first few slides I showed you, um, people like that growing medium a little bit better because if we do get something like this in our soil, we actually need to just move that field. We don't need to be growing anything in that field. Uh, for quite some time until we can at least reduce the pathogens effects on tomatoes or, or peppers. So they can be bad, they can be good. So the mycorrhizal, that's actually a symbiotic relationship. This is actually a good fungal um, organism in the soil. They basically help expand the surface of those roots and that's going to enable that plant to take up more nutrients, um, something like phosphorus. So in exchange that fungi is basically stealing sugar from the plant. So some of you have heard me use this analogy before, those spring wildflowers that we see coming on early in the, in the parks or out on our woodland trails and we want to dig those up and take them home. Well oftentimes where we don't have this mycorrhizal fungi uh, relationship unless you've really been building that soil profile for years and years. Uh, so we're, that's one reason those um, newly transplanted wildflowers don't necessarily take to their new home. They don't have that um, fungi. Again, arthropods, I showed you a picture of several of those a few minutes ago. And of course, they're going to help us shred all that organic material. Uh, they're going to help um, burrow and create those little tunnels and they do control other pests. So you can see there the earthworms. When we see earthworms and we know that's a good thing. Um, I put a few schematics in here just to kind of show how this process works. If you're visual like me, you'll have a couple of different things to look at there. But I like this one. It's pretty simple. It just shows the cycle. We, uh, we've got a plant. It's growing. It dies. It decays. Decomposition. Um, we've got our feeders in the soil that help eat that. And then we're releasing new nutrients into the soil and we go start the process all over again. Uh, you can see from this picture, we've got a lot going on here, but you can see a cover crop. Uh, you can see some leaf litter residue here. You can see some aggregates in the soil. You can see some earthworms, but you can see those roots are running pretty deep. And this is one we'll talk about a little bit more in detail next week as far as cover crops and why this is so critical for building our soil. So before we move on, uh, just remember that weeds are always going to be an issue. So if you are starting a garden in 2021, you know, pay attention. I hope you've been paying attention through the summer, kind of seeing what you, uh, what kind of pressure you have. Uh, because if you, if you have the problem one year, then you're guaranteed to have it in future years. And you can start putting a plan together to kind of help control that. And again, this is something we'll talk more in detail about next week, just trying to get our weed pressure under control. Uh, we spent a couple of weeks ago talking about organic gardening, and I think I showed this slide 
Uh, there would be no organic gardening without organic matter. So it doesn't matter if we're coming uh, to the night's class and we're growing organic or conventional, it all is going to go back to that healthy soil. And remember, it's an ongoing process. Uh, one way to do this or to accomplish this is through compost. And again, if, if this is your first night with us, we have a video and supplemental materials on composting. So I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on this, but just know that composting is going to be a great way to help us build that organic matter content in the soil because it's going to help us reduce the bulk of some of those larger organic materials that take a while to break down. It's going to help us stabilize some of our nutrients and you're going to see how that process works in a little while. And again, it's going to help us speed up the formation of that soil. So let's see here. Um, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Just know that as we're composting, um, it's going to look like rich soil, the finished product is. We want it to smell earthy and be dark and crumbly. Lots of different things that we can be composting there. So make sure if you didn't see that video a couple weeks ago to go back and, and watch that again. But we're going to have all these factors that are going to be involved in that process over time. Uh, another thing, and we're going to speak to this a little bit more in detail next week, but as a green manure, uh, we talk about a cover crop that's grown with that intention of turning them back into the soil. So that's going to be really useful um, if you're just getting started in 2021 or you have an area in your, your garden that is problematic. Um, different green manures are going to offer different advantages. And again, like I say, we'll talk more in detail next week. But alfalfa is going to be one of those that we grow for really deep roots, and it's going to help us break up a compacted soil. So if you are um, coming off of a new construction site, you know, purchased a new home, you know, built a, built a barn, you've got some compaction issues, something like that, alfalfa is going to be a great choice. And of course, those legumes. Um, clover and veg, anything like that is going to grab that nitrogen from there and fix it back into our soil. Plus they serve as a pollinator if you let them bloom. Uh, green manure, just some points to ponder here. Um, they're all going to suppress weeds and help prevent erosion. Um, any kind of um, runoff in a problem area of the garden. Um, it, the big thing here is just to not leave anything bare or unplanted. We always have we, we always want something green and growing. So even in the summertime, using these clovers or buckwheat, uh, we get um, more bang for our buck because they're helping protect our soil as a cover. They're helping to keep crops up off the ground, reducing pathogens. Um, they're also serving as a pollinator. So lots of different uh, benefits there. I'm going to speak to raised beds just for a few minutes, and again, this is something we did back in the spring, so you can refer back to that session, but I just want you to be thinking about these before we get into to the heavy stuff, so kind of tuck these away if you're in raised beds, and a lot of this is going to apply if you are in ground too, uh, but just because it's topsoil doesn't mean it has organic matter. Remember that because we need to continually be rebuilding our soil, so I've, I've spoken a lot about compaction that can actually occur in raised beds too. Sometimes we need to add something like peat or that fluff again to give us some more air drainage. If we do add peat, uh, we need to make sure that we're adding lime because peat is going to lower that pH. Um, I put this schematic or this picture in here, and this is one you'll see a few times tonight because I really want you to, to have this take home message. And hopefully all this will make more sense by the time you, you leave tonight. But uh, when we talk about pH, uh, we don't just talk to, he to hear ourselves talk. There is a real issue there. And you can see from this picture here, the 6.5 pH, which is where we want most of our garden vegetables, uh, landscape plants to be. There are going to be some exceptions there. But for the most part, if we're sitting on a 6.5, you can see what that root is going to look like. If we start hindering that pH, if we're not doing anything to amend it, then we get into a critical situation here. And you can see from a 5.5 to a 5.2 what that root system looks like. So um, this is going to be one of, like I say, the slides you're going to see a few times tonight because even in raised beds, if we're not checking that pH, uh, whether it's a growing media we have in Tennessee, we have a different P, um, soil sample for that that you can do. Make sure that you know what that pH is. 
And I just put this in here to remind me to tell you that you do have this in your Google Drive to refer to uh, your liming, um, liming materials and your equivalents. So make sure you, you pull that up out of the Google Drive. Um, a lot of folks will wait till springtime to want to add that lime addition or do a soil test. But again, we started tonight saying do that now. So make sure that you again are doing that soil test so we can get the right amount of lime added. In the springtime, uh, with a raised bed, you can get away with the pelletized lime um, a little bit better than you can even in ground. It's going to be a little bit more costly. Uh, wood ashes, we get a lot of questions on this. Uh, just know that um, it's going to be too fine to really in, improve that soil structure over time. But you do get a little bit of uh, phosphorus and potassium there. So if you, if you have an area that you pour um, wood ashes, you can usually pull off some pretty big fruit peppers, um, especially like wood, ash, wood ashes. Well, there we go, I already said that. Okay, so another question on raised beds, um, vermiculite versus green manure, always go green. Uh, that vermiculite is not gonna break down quite as well as it costs. Um, in the raised beds, make sure that you're adding compost because we want to be, again, converting that dirt to soil. And notice here we're going to do that a few weeks before planting, not in the fall, because that's when we're going to lose precious nutrition. So that's a little bit different from growing in-ground conventional. And again, if you have those healthy residues, make sure you compost those. Uh, just a quick note on fertilizer. Synthetic is going to give you quick results. Um, but it's going to be lost very quickly due to leaching, and you're going to see how, how all that works. Um, they also don't build that soil structure. So some of those organic materials are going to draw in nuisance pests. So One last thing on raised beds. I put a picture here of a bag of rock phosphate. This is a, a really good enhancer. Uh, it's going to help lead to hopefully larger fruit um, during harvest and give us a little bit earlier maturing, but they've got uh, rock phosphates really rich in minor elements. And so it's gonna basically release that nutrition slowly over time, and the plant's only gonna use it as it needs it. And that's something that can, can last you a while. All right, so we've kind of run the gamut there to kind of hopefully get our brain set uh, for the next Can we all mute ourselves? Everybody check your mute button. Please. Okay, so um, the greatness of soil, let's just jump right into it. And like I said earlier, it is alive. Uh, we have physical and, and chemical, biological properties within, within the soil. So we'll start out with soil texture, why that's important. Um, it's just basically what that soil is gonna feel like. And that's gonna depend on the different sizes of particles in that soil. So we're gonna have sand, silt, and clay. Sand's going to be that largest particle, um, so think about a beach ball. And then uh, think about a frisbee, that's what silt would be the size of. It's almost flowery in consistence. And then we have clay, that's going to be the smallest particle and it's going to feel really sticky. It's what makes everything stick. Think about walking out of a clay field after rain and you're having to like literally pull your leg up off the ground because You've, you've gained like 30 pounds just in clay soil walking through the field. And here's just a diagram to kind of show what that does look like. It's hard to do some of this when we're on Zoom to try to bring it in and, and since we can't pass soil around and touch it and all that. So, um, but as far as the soil texture, um, clay, those really fine, tiny particles that we talk about being sticky and binding everything together, we call that being cohesive. Whereas sand is something we pick up, think about being on the beach and it just runs through our hands, right? So we call that loose. That's what those coarse particles are. What we're going for is something kind of in between or a mixture of all those. So that's what a loam is. It's gonna be a mixture of those sand, silt, and clay particles. And a sandy clay loam typically is what works a little bit better as a growing medium. So you can kind of see from this soil triangle here, and again, this is one of those that we could spend days on, and I'm not gonna to try to burden you with, with all of that, but I, I did want you to see a schematic here where you could see what that in fact looks like. So we're kind of trying to hit the bottom center of that triangle. You can see right here on the right how those particles 
line up. Now, as far as consistency, that's gonna tell us what that general organization of the soil is. So one way to do this is just by holding it in your hand, running it between your thumb and forefinger and just squeezing it till it falls apart. That's one way it's gonna kind of let you know what it is. Is it, is it loose? Is it friable? Is it firm, extremely firm to where you can't even break that? So again, this is kind of hard to do via Zoom because it's easier to be able to play with with soil in our hand, but one way to do this is doing a ribbon test. So again, these fine textured soils, or our clay soils that we often fuss about all the time, um, they're gonna stick together and form these ribbons. So the higher that clay content is, then the more that that soil is gonna stick together like this. And you can see from this slide how shiny or how slick that looks lying there on the hand, that's another indicator of a fine particle soil, like, like the clay. A lot of folks in a raised bed, if they're trying to utilize their own soil, they'll, they'll want to add sand to their heavy clay soil, and what you get with that is indeed a brick. So be very, very cautious with that. Again, we're trying to shoot right in the middle, about a 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay. We really do need that clay, y'all. It's not as bad as what, as what everybody thinks it is. This is really where it's at. It's gonna help us um, bind that soil together. And it's, as you, as you see, as we move on through, it's actually gonna be a great benefit. Um, before I go any further, and there's also a link, I've already passed it back in the slide presentation, but in your Google Drive too, to your local uh, NRCS office, Natural Resource and Conservation Service, because they have the web soil profile that you can go on there and actually pull uh, what you're, and, and I would do that, I think it's with bandwidth and all that, I'm afraid to try to do that live on here, but uh, there is a link in there and all you gotta do is go in, plug in your state, plug in your county uh, and your, your property, it's pretty, straightforward and easy to use, but go in there and kind of see what, uh, what it pulls for your property as to what your soil profile is. I guess talking about all these clay soils reminded me of that. So um, again, you can see this picture here. There's a, there's a lot going on here. And if we really pay attention to our landscape and to our property, again, it can, it can give us many clues. So of course here in East Tennessee, we always see uh, cedars growing wild. We'll see them growing in the medium driving up the interstate. Uh, but typically when we, when we see that, we know we've probably got a fine textured soil. And I'm being nice by calling it fine textured, that's a clay soil, a fine textured soil. We're gonna use those um, simultaneously. That's not the word I'm looking for, but y'all know what I'm saying. Whoops. What happened there? Okay. All right, so again, clay soil, small particles, you're gonna have more surface area. Um, as far as drainage, oftentimes, if we have a really heavy clay soil, we're not gonna have a lot of drainage. So that's another reason we're trying to shoot for that 40, 40, 20% uh, ratio. Whereas sandy soils, water's gonna run right through um, those soils. It's gonna hold uh, not only water very poorly, but think about the, that nutrition, whether we're adding it in an organic form or a conventional synthetic fertilizer form, it's gonna run right through that. And you'll notice here that last point, it's really hard to improve. So if you're in some of our coastal areas, um, sandy soils are gonna be really hard to try to amend and build that soil tilt or soil structure over time. Loamy soil, that's again what we're after. That's gonna be that mixture of soil particle sizes. Um, we're gonna get more bang for our, our buck. So it's just middle ground in terms of uh, nutrition, drainage, and workability. And you can see here this, again, there's so much that's going on below our feet that we don't see these top things, unless it's, it's exposed areas or unless we do a core sample. But you can see this um, color differentiation here, probably in that Couple, top couple inches of that subsoil. So we've got a little bit of organic matter there, but then we've got a really fine red clay soil here. Uh, same here, we've got an organic matter um, layer within that A horizon, but then we have these striations and we can tell we've got a drainage problem because of that gray mottly color. So we know at some point we've had some oxidation occurring or ox 
oxygen depletion, hence the reason we're seeing some of those color variations. Uh, when we do talk about soil structure, uh, we will sometimes refer to these terms, um, granular, blocky, platy, uh, typically what we see probably more here in, in East Tennessee. And again, when we talk about that structure, irregardless, we just want to know that we've got pore space, water space, um, that we've added that organic matter content. We're trying to get a good balance. So you can see why it's so hard to continually always be building soil. We just can't go out there and it do for us what we want it to do. It's something we really have to work at. So this soil here would actually be a, a blocky structure. You can you typically see that here in East Tennessee because of that high clay content. You can see those flat edges. Um, but the other thing about that is that this is, this is a soil that is gonna allow some roots and air and water to move through the profile, but we still need to amend it to help it do that a little bit better. So when we do talk about that structure, um, some of these issues are going to impact that. Of course, we saw a couple slides ago how water will just sit and it doesn't drain. Um, water holding capacity is going to be a huge issue. And if we've got platy soils, of course, that's gonna cause more crusting over time. Uh, compaction is gonna have its own set of issues. But over time, what we wanna do, again, is just keep building that soil so we, we're not having to worry about these issues. So looking again at some of these uh, different photos, um, on the, I have to, because I can't see my whole picture. On the right here, you can see that organic matter layer up here in the top. You can see that there's roots here, but notice those roots don't really extend too much further down into that B horizon. Whereas the further we move to the left, and we can see that dark color, it's got that crumbly texture, so we know we've got organic matter there. And we can see roots that are actually penetrating down deep. Uh, we, we've got to think about that rooting zone or the rooting depth. And again, there's going to be some things that are going to be outside of our control. But if you have these issues going on in your, uh, on your farm or on your homestead, Hopefully this will give you some clues to how to correct some of those. But again, bedrock is gonna be uh, an issue. That's something you can't control. And, and bedrock is gonna be what's there, that parent material. So like at my house, um, I have huge amounts of exposed limestone rock. Uh, so I know I've got some shallow areas of that red clay. That's usually a pretty good indicator of that. So that's, that's that bedrock that I'm, I'm dealing with. And again, just remember, I'm showing this to you again as we move through the next few slides. Remember that um, horizon A, we want about six to eight inches, and then B, we want about 30 inches, 36 inches total. But sometimes we hit this thing called a fragipan. And that's basically where over time you've got this compressed layer of soil. Uh, usually that's going to be about six inches or greater, and that's usually in a combination of silts and loams where we're going to see that. So they've basically just been repeatedly wet and then dried, and they leave that compressed or compacted area under our feet that we might not necessarily see, but we might get some plant growth issues, and we might have that light bulb moment. Well, there might be something going on there that I need to bust that soil up um, a little bit further down than what I have been doing. Uh, fragile pans, as you'll notice here, are also going to have that little bit of a modeling, very distinct yellowish tan color. This is not a color we want to see in soil. So if you ever see that, know that that's, that's not a good thing. We need to be working on amending that. Again, that effective rooting depth is going to be that 36 inches. So you can see there what that's looking like. We're getting that root penetration down deep. Um, here's a picture of those rock outcrops. This is not my house, but it, it would look very similar to this. So, you know, I, I know that if I wanted to plant a garden right out here, I'm going to have an issue with that. I'm not going to be able to go very deep. I'm not going to be able to probably get that 36 inches um, and, and see more outcrops back here in the back. So we probably also know you can see some exposed soil here, that red color. So we know it's going to be a, 
a fine textured clay soil. Uh, we get questions asked a lot of times about those rock fragments and the rocks. Um, you know, we, a few of those is not going to be a huge issue. If we get into some big blocky structures, then of course that can be a problem because they're going to impede the um, roots from being able to go deep in search of water and or nutrition. So um, I can, I remember my first job on the farm was actually harvesting rocks. That's what my papa used to call it. It was like, for Pete's sake, we might not be able to grow anything else in this holler, but we can grow rocks because I was constantly, I thought they were, I thought I was just a bad child and they, I, I told them it was abuse as I got older and realized, you know, what was going on. But we say that that's a character builder, so there you go. Okay, so just a few more issues to consider. Uh, I introduced you to infiltration there just a minute ago, but again, that's going to be that movement of water um, into the soil from the ground surface, whether we're doing that or whether it's from rain. Now, that's going to be really dependent on texture and structure, so ho hopefully you're starting to put those puzzle pieces together and, and realize that this is going to be an ongoing process because this is what we want water to do. We want to have this pore space to where it just freely flows and infiltrates into that soil. But sometimes we get into that area of compaction, kind of alluded to some of this earlier, but of course construction or um, let's just say we're going to till up an area in our yard for 2021. So what have we been doing to that yard all summer? For the last 20 summers, we've been mowing back and forth over it so probably we've got a little bit of compaction going on. Another issue is if we uh, work the soil when it's wet. So we're going to talk about that more next week when we plant those cover crops and we go to turning those under. We want to make sure that we're hitting that delicate balance because if it's too wet then that can cause clods which can also lead to um, cracking soils and compaction problems. And then if we are working the soil, we want to make sure that we're not working it to the same depth all the time. We want to think about rotating some of that. And again, those are some things we'll talk about next week. But So you just saw that picture of infiltration and what that looks like. If we have a compacted soil structure, that's what it's going to look like. So you can tell the big difference here of why we really need to work on our overall uh, soil consistency structure and that soil tilth. Adding organic matter um, is going to be one of the greatest benefits that we can do. It's going to help impede compaction from being a major issue. Okay, so I've, I've talked a, a lot about uh, different issues, not kind of building up as we move along. Uh, so hopefully you're again starting to put the puzzle pieces together. So one of the biggest issues, and this is a personal opinion, but I think water holding capacity um, is, is one of the biggest issues that we have, especially here in, in Tennessee, because that can be the success or the failure um, of your garden. Um, how that soil or that soil's ability to be able to hold moisture for that plant, um, especially when we get into a dry year. You know, when you really think about it in simple terms, think about hydroponics. You know, we can grow plants in water uh, without a soil media, but can we ever really grow plants without water? No. So that's just one way to bring it down to simplistic terms. So again, some of those factors that are going to affect this water holding capacity are going to be those different soil particles. Um, how deeply we can be rooting our plants. Remember we want a 36, combined, 36 inch combined of the A and B horizon. We have to think about fragments, rock fragments. You know, if we've got a few small rocks, that's not going to be a big issue. If you've got big boulders out there, it can it can be um, possibly detrimental. And then slope. You know, the steeper that slope gets, uh, then of course water holding capacity is going to be decreased. So another few things, uh, and and you have some definitions and also some. Um, supporting materials handouts in the Google Drive, so make sure you refer back to that. But just knowing uh, what these terms mean, because if you talk with an extension agent, sometimes they'll use saturation or field capacity or wilting point. And that's basically just 
when and here's the schematic to kind of show that again I usually like to do hands-on things to be able to demonstrate this a little bit better but you know after we go through um, weeks of drought and of course we've been pretty lucky the last couple of years but um, it eventually gets to the point and think about think about this too and I'm always saying when we plant that tomato and we don't want to be out there watering it every single day because that pr promotes that shallow rooting so this is another way that you can think about that we, we want to water a couple times a week an inch and a half to two inches because that's going to push those roots down deep well when we get into a period of drought if we've got a good soil with good soil tilth and good soil structure then that soil's ability to hold water is going to be much better than if it's just a 80% clay or of course with sand water is going to run right through it but we want to be able to hold a little bit of water there so that plant's ability to live a little bit longer during a drought is going to be one of those instances otherwise we reach that wilting point and plants are not going to be able to extract that remaining water that's going to be left in the soil that's where we often need to intervene with irrigation hopefully that explains a little bit about why we want to promote that and why we want to continually build our soil because we want to have good water holding capacity in our soil we don't want it running right through and we don't want it just sitting there and not going anywhere because both of those are going to lead to problems uh, different ways that we describe drainage you can see those here again if we've got gray models in our soil if you've got an issue go out there and do a core sample uh, take a shovel and try to to dig deep and see if you've got any of that weird modeling going on because we do have a lot of that especially with the last couple years our soils have kind of told the tale uh, they've kind of tattletailed on us so if you will and I myself I have an issue in one part of my property um, that I didn't realize was an issue until earlier in the summer so and you can see there this is a, a picture of a row crop field but just to be able to show you um, visioning out you can see the differentiation of that color and you can see that gray color whoops also in this profile and remember we were talk, talking about we saw that in that frangipan uh, slide earlier we've got a good layer of organic matter but then we have these models so we know water has just been basically sitting there it's not been able to uh, run through and if that weren't enough you know we got lo lots of things that are going to affect soil but then erosion uh, most of us think about erosion just as soil loss um, via the wind or water or runoff uh, but if we're covering that soil and helping protect it from those elements then we're going to protect our natural resource uh, and mulches and plant covers um, that's going to be a number one way to do that sometimes reducing our slope uh, we can't really do that unless we come in with a uh, ex ex excavator or something like that but um, you can see here just from a soil um, probe you can see that slice uh, the top six inches of the soil there you can see that it's kind of mixing with that B horizon again this is hard to show and don't have live samples in front of me so um, the color contrast is probably not that um, easy to see versus actually seeing that in person but you can actually see where it's modeling together here and that's actually an indicator of erosion and actually this might be a better picture to kind of show what that what I mean by that so oftentimes we think about erosion on a bare field or on a steep slope but it can occur just like this in this instance So again, um, it's just from that soil not being able to drain away. You can see that lighter color, some of those striations there in the soil. So water can deposit this, the soil and uh, water can take it away all at the same time. But the other thing I was gonna mention here, all those rocks that I was picking up, that's another indicator of erosion is when we see those rock fragments come into that soil line after we've tilled our ground. Okay, so I showed you this slide way back at the beginning, how soil is filling the role that plants need. And hopefully, again, we're packing some stuff up here in the old noggin. 
But just a word of caution before we go any further, um, I've preached a lot on organic matter, but know that sometimes you can't have too much of a good thing. It, it can uh, add nutrients that can cause imbalances. And I, I'm just trying to set the scene here for the next, uh, the next session on the soil chemistry. Um, oil, organic matter, it can alter our pH and that can influence our nutrient availability. So we always wanna be making sure that we, we have that pH right where it needs to be. Organic matter, it can hold water, but sometimes it can hold it too well. And then it can also reduce nutrients available to our crops as it breaks down. So we, we need to, to make sure that we find that balance. And that's where the soil chemistry of this evening comes in. This is usually when everybody gets nervous and they start leaving, so don't leave me hanging there. Uh, but just taking it in simplistic terms, we look at the periodic table and we see N, P, and K circled there, right? Well, what is N, P, and K? That is what we um, have on the fertilized bags, right? So what is chemistry? Those N, P, and K, those are elements. Those are going to be the simplest form of matter on the planet. Uh, they can't be broken down into anything simpler. And they can exist alone, just like that NPK um, or oxygen. So most of those are gonna be made to exist uh, alone, but think about we as humans, we like to, you know, this COVID socially distancing, it's killed a few of us that are really extroverted, right? Well, elements are the same way. They don't like to party by themselves. So uh, they tend to combine with one another and that's what we call compounds. And when they form, when they come together to form these compounds, that's what we call a chemical reaction. So chemistry, all that is, is the study of how and why those elements are combining and, and then breaking apart through those chemical reactions. So that soil chemistry is just simply studying how and why they're, they're formed or broken apart in the soil and how those reactions are affecting our plants. So what happens when we have an atom that has too many electrons? Well, it's gonna have a negative charge and we're gonna call that an anion. Well, if we have uh, an atom that doesn't have enough electrons, then it's gonna have a positive charge and we call those cations. So let's go back and look at our periodic table and I have sodium and it should be chlorine circled over here. I can't see it, but Hopefully it is, I think it's number 17. So basically what we're doing is we have this negative charge chlorine, which is an anion, and we're gonna combine it with a positive charged sodium, which is a cation. Okay, so it's plus minus, they're attracted to one another, sodium chloride makes salt. Hopefully that's a pretty easy analogy. So let's look at soil cations and anions. And then you'll notice here that I have chemical symbols and then their ionic form because the ionic form is what we're concerned about with our soil. When we start talking about pH and fertility issues, this is where it's gonna be the most critical. So you can see all these pluses here versus all the negatives, right? So we have the cations and the anions. Well, here's where it's at. This is another reason, think about that 20% in our sand, silt, and clay profile. Remember 40% sand, 40% silt, 20% clay, and then we've got a little tiny slice of organic matter in there. Well, uh, clay has a, a negative charge, and organic matter is also gonna have that negative charge. So a clay particle in our soil is gonna carry negative charges. Well, think about what we just looked at, those, that periodic table, with our anions and our cations. So when we start thinking about plant nutrition, and I'm just gonna use ammonium nitrate here because that's one hopefully we all know, but we'll talk about a nitrogen fertilizer, uh, fertilizer ammonium nitrate. Well, that's two different forms of nitrogen. We have one that's actually gonna be an anion and one that's gonna be a cation. So those positive charges are gonna to attach to that clay soil because clay is negative. So remember this, we're gonna build on this as we move through. Whereas we have this nitrate, it's negative. So it's just, they're gonna hit one another, but they're not gonna attach. So keep that in the back of your mind. So we're talking about these macronutrients, which are our MP and K, and then we also throw in calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. 
Of course, sulfur is going to be that material that we use to really drop the pH if we're growing, growing blueberries or rhododendrons or azaleas. Whereas calcium and magnesium, blah, magnesium are the components of lime, and we're going to use that to raise that soil pH if we're growing a garden. And we want that pH to be around a 6.5. Well, again, you can kind of see these positives and negatives floating around out here. So we know that those positives, again, are going to attach to that clay soil just a little bit better. They're not going to be moving through the soil quite as fast. Okay, so here we are, this NO3, the nitrate. We know that it's going to be really high, highly soluble. And it's going to be readily available to plant roots, but as a result, too, it's also going to leach out very quickly. Remember, it has nowhere to stick to. It's got nothing to bind itself to. Um, that's one reason that it can cause this groundwater contamination. Some of you have heard of that, because nitrate always moves with water. It's always going to be leaching out of the soil because, again, we don't have that uh, cohesiveness there. It's going to be able to attach itself to, whereas that ammonium ion is actually beneficial because when we talk about cover crops next week and we're talking about turning this huge amount of biomass under, bacteria, remember we talked about that early on, that's, you know, one teaspoon has millions of bacteria cells and just one teaspoon of soil. Okay, so this is where that's coming into play. Bacteria are going to help eat all that biomass when we turn that cover crop under and they're releasing this ammonium, this NH4. And that's going to keep increasing as that microbial activity increases. So you can get this from um, organic methods or we can also get this obviously in a synthetic fertilizer form. So the big point here is notice that that ammonium is going to be attracted to that clay soil particle, so it's not going to leach out like that nitrate. So when we start talking or looking at our soil test, and we hopefully that's going to have some of those light bulb moments when we get those reports back, and you see what's being recommended for your vegetable garden or for your, for your orchard. And then I just threw this in here because one of my presentations, somebody had asked about uh, the nitrite. So there is a conversion in the soil nitrate to nitrite. Um, that will often lead to soluble salt buildup. If you ever hear that terminology, um, I come from a tobacco background, so nitrosamines, that's a, that's a huge issue there. And oftentimes that's going to be driven by nitrogen fertility or um, even weather related. But um, I just wanted to make you aware of that. So we talked about those macronutrients, the big six, and then we have all these micronutrients. So when you do a soil test in Tennessee, you get your soil test report back, you're going to see all these other elements here in their simplest form. But then this is the form, the ionized form that that plant is going to utilize. Now I don't want to bog you down into a lot of details, but you've heard me often say in plant disease class that uh, sometimes it's not disease or in the, in the insect class I'll say it's not insect, a lot of times it's physiological. So this is where that comes into play. Some of these deficiencies or these toxicities in the soil, the plant is exhibiting these symptoms and it's telling us it's not happy with the soil pH or that it doesn't have some of this nutrition that it needs to thrive and survive. So that's where a lot of this comes into play and it's all going back to um, the soil pH and the cation exchange capacity. So when we talk about cation exchange capacity, remember again that clay is going to be negative and those cations are going to be positively charged. So when we, when we talk about that cation exchange capacity, that's that measure of the capacity of that soil to hold those nutrients that have that positive charge without them just running through the ground and disappearing. They're actually going to be able to put those to work. And I told you we're going to see this picture again. So soils with that high cation exchange capacity are going to be able to supply a little bit larger amount of nutrients. Whereas a low cation exchange capacity soil like sand, remember we said everything runs right through it. It doesn't have that clay that's binding it, so it doesn't have that negative charge to where anything will stick to it. So it's just going to run right through that sand. Uh, usually if you have a sandier soil, you're going to have to make more frequent applications uh, of a low rate fertilizer throughout that season. 
Uh, you'll notice there again, both your clay and organic matter are gonna serve as those sources by attracting those cations. It's not just that clay. That's another reason we want to be building that organic matter content. So we do say 40, 40, and 20, but remember that little slice of the pie for organic matter, we want somewhere between three and 6% there. And again, if we've got uh, a large amount of clay or organic matter, then we're gonna have a higher exchange capacity. And I keep repeating this because I'm hoping, I'm hoping this is sinking in as to why it's so important. And, and clay's not all that bad. Um, another thing to, to think about, we often hear about aluminum um, and sodium. I talked about sodium earlier. Both of those are cations, right? So them being a cation, and we know that they could um, attach themselves to that clay particle. But that's not really a plant nutrient. Plants don't want them. Um, the plant's not going to use them. So if we start messing around with the pH, as you're going to see here in a minute, then that can tie up and lead to some toxicity in the soil. So again, just a little bit of a illustration to show you the negative particles. Uh, clay particles are organic. Uh, then we have the cations that are gonna attach and, and bind to those. And then you can just see how we've got pore space, water space, just a good soil, good schematic there. And then when we talk about that soil solution, in essence, all we're doing is taking it up a, a notch or two, I guess. When we think about cation exchange capacity, we need water to help move those nutrients through the soil, right? So we'll call that that soil solution. And that's often where some of those micronutrients, the borons and the zincs and the manganese, are gonna come into play because they're gonna be uh, more readily available when we have infiltration occurring in that soil. So you can see again why it's gonna be very important to build that soil structure to have good drainage. And again, those nutrients, I just put that in here. We can get that in organic or conventional uh, fertilized forms. We have that naturally occurring with mineralization, um, plant uptake. Our microbes are gonna have to have that in order to, to sustain themselves. I, I guess I jumped ahead of myself there, but uh, how these plants are taking, taking that up. So that's that soil particle again, your clay and your organic matter, all your cation here, we've got the plant root, and then we have these little root hairs that are coming off. So this does take some energy from the plant to be able to do this, but basically they're just reaching out and they're, they're taking, they're extracting that nutrition from that water as it moves through the plant. So that's where we come in with pH. So we've talked about all the big six and the micro and the micro, the macro, micronutrients. So what is pH? Well, basically that's your two H's and your O, your H and your OH. Uh, low pH means you have more hydrogen atoms floating around. A higher pH means you've got more hydroxide floating around. Because water's kind of strange. It's self-ion is ion is the ion. I cannot talk y'all tonight. It falls apart into ions the self-ionization of water. Only a small amount uh, to do that. It's just a simple measure. Again, all we're doing is measuring those hydrogen ions. And it is, again, driven by that self-ionization of water. And all we're doing here is measuring acidity below seven, alkalinity above seven. So the reason that pH matters, so I'm gonna get on my soapbox here, I don't try to sell the soil test. I don't care where you get a soil test, just do a soil test. It's like um, an EKG for your heart. If you don't know where to start, you don't know what to fix, right? You may not have to fix anything. Your soil may be perfect. I don't care if you're a seasoned gardener or you're just getting started, this is where it's at. So do a soil test because the soil pH matters. We spent the last hour talking about all these things and it really all boils down to the next few slides because pH is going to affect all of those nutrients, all those cations we've been talking about, how we're fertilizing or feeding our plants. Um, it can affect that soil texture it, and it is going to change. Um, the big thing to remember is that a, a native pH has the tendency to revert. So again, it's not like if you want to grow blueberries, you're going to go out there and put sulfur on this field 
tomorrow, plant blueberries next spring, and never touch that soil again. You're, you're going to have to constantly stay at it. Same thing with your, with your garden. If you start out with a 5.5 and you're having to make that lime addition, you can't just do it one time. Um, but once you get your garden to an area that you kind of know what it's going to do, you become acquainted with it, then you don't have to soil test every year. You can do it every couple years, every three years. But at least to get you started, make sure you know where your pH is and take those steps necessary to get us where we need to be. So again, um, pH availability for gardens is going to be best between the 6.2 and uh, 6.8. So if you look at it on this scale, you can you can see all these little schematics for each one of these micronutrients. And the reason that that's so important, so if we, if we get a low pH and we're trying to grow tomatoes, well, we're going to have an abundance of iron and that can cause some major issues. Also, if we're trying to grow tomatoes and our pH is sitting on a 5.5, look where our calcium levels are at. So we talk a lot about blossom end rotten tomatoes, right? And we say that that's a calcium deficiency. And it's also uh, related to moisture uptake in the plant, those moisture fluctuations. So are you, you see where I'm going with this? I didn't expand a, or spend a lot of time on this and plant diseases, but blossom end rot might be trying to tell us something about the pH of our soil. Because as you can see, when we start dropping below, where we, that 6.5, where we have some adequate calcium, we start really losing some calcium here, right? It gets tied up with that pH. That's, that is what is directly driving that phenomenon. Um, also, if we get uh, too low a pH, sometimes in cucumbers, we'll get into what we call manganese toxicity. It's really, it's a beautiful leaf, um, yellow veining of the plant leaf it's really cool to look at that it almost looks like a viral disease but that can often be manganese toxicity so right there's two big things we've talked about in our garden that are not disease or insect related they're driven specifically by ph so that's why it's so critical to make sure we know where that ph is at again if nothing else look at this picture here i don't know what this plant is but we'll pretend it's a tomato um, the more that plant has the ability to extend its root into that soil, preferably a combination of the A and B horizon at a depth of 36 inches, uh, in a good pH, then the better off we're going to be. So even if we just drop one whole point on that pH scale, we can see what those roots are going to look like. And look at the difference there just in three tenths. Um, pretty significant study, stunning. You only see a few little root hairs even hitting into that B horizon. So that's going to be a major issue. And especially think about going into periods of drought conditions. This plant is going to have a longer term survival rate than either one of these. Um, again, if you're a visual, I put in some different um, illustrations of the pH scale, kind of showing her normal, everyday, basic um, products are falling in there, just so you'll kind of know. Also, when we talk about mulches, know the difference between your hardwood and your softwood, because sometimes um, that can also drive um, pH changes. So again, using that blueberry analogy, they like a really acidic soil. So if we're adding white pine sawdust, then they're a little bit more acidic than some of our other hardwoods would be. So then it's about fixing your pH. And again, we've talked about this a little bit, alluded to it. We're going to raise that pH by adding lime. And remember that calcium and magnesium are going to be positively um, charged. So they're going to attach to that clay a little bit better. We're going to lower um, adding sulfur. Uh, notice here at this third point, don't just be out there adding stuff. Um, that, that's why it's going to be really really uh, important to know where our pH is, to know exactly how much and what we need to be adding. Uh, notice there again, don't expect a long-term change. That's one reason we say do your um, soil test now. Start amending uh, your soil over the next six months. That lime has a little bit longer um, to activate. And again, soil pH can revert to its native um, over time. 
And again, just looking at those macronutrients, again, the availability, your NP and your K, your calcium and magnesium. Um, when we look at some of those issues in plants, um, knowing if they're mobile in soil or mobile in the plants is going to tell us a lot about specific deficiency and toxicity versus disease issues. And I know we're all getting tired, so I'm going to skip going into a lot of that, but just know that when we know that something's mobile in the soil, it's going to be more prone to leaching. It's going to move right through. If it's not mobile, then it's going to need to be applied a little bit closer to the plants. Um, if we do have a mobile material in the plants, it means deficiencies are going to be seen on those um, older leaves. If it's not mobile, then we're going to see it on younger leaves. So if you're a plant PI, a sleuth and investigator, those type things can really help you. So um, just real quick, nitrogen is uh, part of that chlorophyll molecule. Uh, we're going to have plants that could be 2 to 5% nitrogen. We're going to be making those additions again through organic matter or synthetic or um, um, organic or atmospheric nitrogen. But if we have deficiencies, we all know that nitrogen deficiency is going to show us a yellowing or stunning growth, right? But that always occurs in that older tissue. Uh, potassium, that's going to help us maintain the balance of cells and enzyme functions. It's going to help with our fruit quality. Uh, leaf margins are going to show yellow flecks from modeling, and then we're going to have this scorched looking appearance. And then phosphorus, uh, which is key for photosynthesis, um, you're going to get this reddish color with stunting that, that is going on. And so I also put this in your Google Drive so you can go back and kind of study that a little bit more to look at some of the plant phenomenon that might be going on. But again, to bring that home a little bit more. Um, we'll just look at a corn plant and you can see what those deficiencies look like. Uh, nitrogen deficiency, you can see that phosphorus is going to be that reddish color and then potassium. Uh, we're going to have that scorched look on the fringe of the leaf. Uh, the, the cool thing about this is that no matter what plant it is, it's going to exhibit the exact same symptom. So this is a tomato with deficiency in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And you notice how potassium can almost look like a, a blight. Um, so that's one reason it's real critical to get that checked out, make sure that we know what we're looking at. And poor old calcium, I've already beat it to death, but um, we're gonna see that in young tissue. But again, remember that's those fluctuations in, in moisture and pH. And there's a magnesium um, toxicity, what that's gonna look like. It's mobile in the plant, so you're going to see that in those older tissues. And again, that's all directly related back to this pH scale. Uh, if we're sitting right where we need to be sitting, I think my circle is off just a little bit there. <laughs> it should be up here on a 6.8. But um, as long as we're sitting where we need to be sitting with pH, then all these other things are not going to be major issues. And then if we do get early blight in our tomatoes, then we're going to be like, oh, I think this is early blight. And it may not be a potassium or a phosphorus issue. Uh, a couple more slides and then I'm going to let y'all go, but uh, we often get questions about tillage in the garden. Is that a good uh, or bad practice? And um, that's a big question and I, I think that's actually going to be a matter of preference. Uh, the science can can go both ways there. Um, it's, it's not going to be a one size fits all. Um, you just need to really study your site, know what you're comfortable with. Um, as far as looking at practices, it, it can indeed incorporate any of our organic matter. Um, it can control weeds. It can help us with compaction issues through aerating that soil. It can help us increase warming um, in the spring bed. And then it, it can also give us that really fine seed bed if we're planting like wildflower seeds or um, lettuce seeds or something like that in the spring. Um, it's also going to hasten that organic matter breakdown. You'll see that more next week when we talk again about turning that biomass under. Uh, but it can bring up weed seed. And if you're like me, you've had enough of nut sedge, morning glories, Harry Gallon Zoga, and pigweed. Because that's pretty much what Melody's Garden is this year. So it's lucky they call me the hillbilly hippie because I can at least still go out there and feast from my garden. But that's a whole nother subject. Um, tillage can also help break up any large soil aggregates. 
um, and it can reduce large pores and, and channels. But at the same time, um, we see here aerate and compaction, it can also hasten uh, compaction as well, especially if we're tilling to that same depth all the time. So we'll spend a little bit more time talking about this next week, but cover crops, and there are also some supplemental materials in the Google Drive. But remember, all through tonight, it all comes back to that soil structure. Okay, so this is, this is what we're going after. We want that balanced ratio, sand, silt, clay, we want organic matter, we want water and uh, air channels to move through there. So uh, when you get your soil test rating back, it's gonna have all of these different ratings. Uh, we run the gamut um, here in Greenville, so some soils are gonna be pretty high. The reason I put this in here is because you might not need to make an addition of NP or K, or you might have to make a monumental application depending on what you're growing or just how depleted your soil is. So again, that's why it's critical to get that um, soil test done to know where you're sitting, to know what you need to be doing. So the next few slides just talk about how to soil sample. I'm not gonna, let's see what time are we sitting? I got about 10 minutes. Uh, make sure that you're doing a random sampling. You can see here from the schematic, this overview, you don't want to go out there in this garden and take one sample, okay? We want to get a randomized sampling throughout that field. Now, you could do one field and call it field one and field two, or if you have pretty much the same issues going on, which to kind of look at it, there might be some issues going on here on the right-hand side of that right field, uh, you could break it into two samples. Um, if you've got any kind of problem area, you might want to do a separate sampling. But make sure you get um, an adequate number of, of samples and make sure you're going at a depth of six inches. Uh, extension offices have these probes that they'll loan out to you. Or you can just use a spade, get a good core sample, make sure that it's dry, uh, mix all of those samples together in one bucket and add to this little box. So you just need about a cup to be able to do that. So. Basically what that soil test is gonna tell you is what your crops are gonna need. Uh, you can actually select multiple um, crops. So like if you're doing, you know, within a veggie garden, you can just do one soil test and call it a garden. Um, if you're getting ready to soil test an area and you're thinking, well, I, I might make this a blueberry patch. I might make this a vegetable garden or I might put uh, some kind of wildlife plot here. We'll check all three of those boxes and what it's gonna do is send you back a report for each of those. So you'll kind of know which direction you wanna move in. Um, as far as that fertilizer application, it's gonna give you all the specifics for what you need to be doing. It's gonna tell you about pre-plant, in, in season, any kind of lay-by application that it's going, going to need. Um, these are just some basic recommendations, but again, the soil test, if you call me and ask me what to, to put on something pre-plant, I hate doing that because I'm not gone. I have no idea what that situation is. And you know, sometimes people will think, well, I just need to add a little bit, that's better than nothing. Or they get out there and they get happy with too much nitrogen. So you know, we've, we've got that line, we've got a deficiency and we see those yellowing and stunted growth, but then if we put too much nitrogen, we've got really tall, pretty tomato plants and not one fruit because that hinders fruit production. So if we get that soil test, it's gonna tell us exactly what we need to be applying. And again, this is where we want to be at the end of the night. So remember, God made dirt, dirt won't hurt but you gotta transform that dirt to soil to be productive and profitable. And remember, all living things come from soil, not dirt. Uh, master gardeners in the big springs have all heard me, uh, have all heard me do this and I'll do this in class. I'll take off my shoe and sling it at them and be like, dirt is on the bottom of your shoe. And soil is the upper biochemical weathered portion of the regolith, but y'all don't have to remember that part. Um, so also tonight, we were supposed to do crop rotation. But I think what I'm gonna do is roll that into cover crops for next week because I have kept us on here almost an hour and a half and I think everybody, the few people I can see are like, their eyes are crossing and they're thinking, chemical bonds? I just need to go to bed and bury my head out in the garden. So, 
I, that's what I'm going to do for next week. I'm just going to cut that. So if you uh, go into the Google Drive, you're going to see that portion at the end of this PowerPoint. But just hold all those questions for next week, and they're going to be recorded. So if you can't come next week, it'll it'll still be there, and you'll have access to it. But um, I haven't been able to see um, questions or anything. Now I can't see anybody. There we go. So let's see. Nobody slumped over with their head on their desk. I see people that are alive. Eyes are coming uncrossed, so we're making a little progress here. <laughs> so I hope y'all got something out of tonight. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to send an email. Um, and I'll get back with um, what's in the chat box and get that sent out to you tonight or tomorrow. So as always, fun, fun. Go forth and prosper, and hopefully I'll see all you guys next week.